Hello, everyone. Welcome to the last installment of Metcalf Institute's 26th Annual Public Lecture Series. I'm Sunshine Menezes, Metcalf Institute's Executive Director, and I'm joining you today from the traditional and current homelands of the Narragansett and Niantic peoples. Their lands and waters originally encompassed what is now the state of Rhode Island um, into Eastern Connecticut and Southern Massachusetts. We want to honor and respect the enduring and continuing relationship between the Narragansett and the Niantic peoples and this land by teaching and learning more about their history and present day communities and by becoming stewards of the land that we also inhabit. The University of Rhode Island's Metcalf Institute has been advancing informed and inclusive public conversations about science and the environment since 1998. We achieve this through science training for professional journalists, communication training for scientists, and public events like this one. We also founded the Inclusive SciComm Symposium, which brings together researchers and practitioners from around the world to make all types of science communication more inclusive and equitable. This year's lecture series has explored the transition to a clean energy decarbonized society. We have heard about the urgency of this moment, the challenges of rising to it, and the opportunities for innovation. We have heard just how essential it is to center equitable approaches throughout our planning and our implementation in this transition. So far, we've heard from scientists and engineers and business innovators about how to approach this paradigm shift. Today, fittingly, we end with a reflection by one of the nation's leading climate change and energy reporters, Sammy Roth. We thank you all for being here today to begin exploring this critical aspect of the topic with us. Those of you who have been tuning in this month have heard me say a few times now that we have a special dollar for dollar matching opportunity this month until June 30th tomorrow for all donations up to $12,500. Your gifts support public programs like this one, as well as career-changing training for journalists and scientists, all in the interest of advancing conversations that increase awareness and action on the urgent challenges posed by climate change and environmental inequities. As of right now, we need to raise only $655 more by tomorrow to meet the challenge. So if you would like to help us meet that goal and get your gift automatically doubled, please click on the link that is now in the chat. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our final speaker in the 2023 Metcalf Institute public lecture series. It's probably no surprise that we at Metcalf Institute would say there is no subject more important for journalists to get right than climate change. Thankfully, this is a sentiment that is gaining popularity. Today's speaker has spent the last decade learning how to cover this complicated and ever-changing beat with a focus on the shift from fossil fuels to clean power. Today, he will discuss what he's learned on the front lines of the renewable energy transition, from the difficulty of finding low conflict sites for solar and wind farms, to the mistakes many reporters make when writing about climate. Sammy Roth covers energy for the Los Angeles Times and writes the weekly Boiling Point email newsletter. He previously reported for the Desert Sun and USA Today, where he covered climate and the environment, and he graduated from Columbia University with a degree in sustainable, de sustainable development. He has written about the electric grid, water politics, the tension between conservation and renewable energy development on public lands, and climate change impacts, including intensifying droughts and wildfires. Sammy is an award-winning reporter whose work has been recognized as some of the country's best environmental beat reporting by the Society of Environmental Journalists and Best Business Reporting by the Gerald Loeb Awards. He's also been recognized by the Investigative Reporters and Editors, Best of the West, the Press Club of Atlantic City's National Headliner Awards, and the California Newspaper Publishers Association. It is my great pleasure to welcome Sammy Roth to talk with us today. Um, well, thank you, Sunshine, for that. <clears throat> Extremely kind of introduction, and uh, thank you to the, the Metcalf Institute for the opportunity to be part of this really wonderful uh, lecture series on climate change and the clean energy transition. I'm 
I'm so glad you guys are spotlighting these issues. And I've, I've actually had the privilege of um, interviewing and, and getting to know some of the, the previous uh, researchers and, and journalists who gave talks. I don't know if any of you listening to this were, were there for that, but uh, Grace Wu, Emily Gruber, Jeff St. John from Canary Media, uh, they're all doing important work. And I, I was glad to see that being highlighted here. Um, so I, I guess I, I would start by saying that I, I first got interested in climate change when I was like a teenager because I somehow was a political junkie at the time for various reasons. And climate change just seemed like such an obvious one where it was like, okay, we should definitely be doing something about this, right? Why is this so controversial? Why is the Republican Party against doing something about it? Why are the Democrats not able to figure out you know, what to do even when they're in charge of government? I mean, I was 17 years old, uh, for those who uh, remember this, around 2009, when Joe Kerry and uh, John Kerry and Joe Lieberman and, and John McCain had that cap and trade bill in Congress that ultimately went down in flames. And I, I remember really strongly reading this New York Magazine piece, New Yorker Magazine piece about what went wrong that was titled As the World Burns um, during my first semester in college. And just really explained in excruciating detail how and, and why the bill had failed. And it left this really strong impression on me that no matter how clear it was that we need to phase out fossil fuels or how inexpensive solar and wind energy might get, that ultimately the political influence of the fossil fuel industry was going to make the clean energy transition really, really challenging. And, and I was thinking about that. That was several years before the big Exxon new investigations that um, LA Times and Inside Climate News published, basically exposing in, in great detail how Exxon and the other oil companies had just done this tremendous work over the decades, covering up climate science and obstructing climate action. Um, so even in advance of that, it was it was pretty clear to me as I started to get into these issues that um, getting around these political hurdles to clean energy was going to require a lot of extremely powerful journalism to help people see what is really happening with our climate and, and very importantly, what's really happening with our politics. Um, there's definitely been some positive change since then. So one big thing is there's way more acceptance now of the reality of, of climate science than there was a decade ago. And if you look at the public polling on this, generally only about 10% of Americans um, are really hardcore climate deniers. Uh, you know, there's there's varying levels about, you know, where everyone else is that, but, but really only about a 10th of people would say, no, climate change isn't real, this is a hoax, or it's not happening at all. And when I'm doing my journalism, I am not thinking especially hard about trying to reach those people or, or to convince them that climate change is real. At this point, they are down a really deep misinformation rabbit hole. And and I, I just think it's kind of a, a waste of time and not really uh, feasible to think about pulling them out of it. I I spend all of my time thinking about the other 90% of people targeting articles at them, people who understand, yes, the world is getting hotter and, and people who might actually be interested in what we should do about that. And, and again, to be clear, not all of those 90% of people are you know convinced that climate change is a crisis and that we need to stop burning fossil fuels immediately. There's there's a range of, of views about you know how bad is this and what should we do about it. But I'm thinking about, you know, who can I really reach with these articles? I, you know, if I write about fire and drought and heat waves and extreme storms, you know, can I help people understand how serious a crisis we're we're really in? And if I write about renewable energy, which is my my main focus, um, and I write about how it's gotten so much more inexpensive and what's going on with batteries and what are all the other technologies that can help us replace coal and oil and gas. Um, I, I think I can make a really big difference there in sort of helping people understand, you know, this is possible, we can make this transition. And to the extent that there are still challenges to be overcome, which there are, what are those challenges and, and how can we go about trying to overcome them? So, I mean, as, as Sunshine, Sunshine told you earlier, I mean, I'm a climate reporter, but really energy is my beat. And I would say the main thing that I, I really spend time focusing on is how can we put together the pieces of 100% clean energy? I mean, that is you know, plus or minus a few percentage points, definitely where we need to go. What is it going to take to get there? And when I started covering this uh, just about a decade ago, I was at the Desert Sun newspaper in Palm Springs, California, and I was really in the right place at the right time. And I was lucky and because it was it was right out there sort of outside of Palm Springs in the Mojave Desert in California, sort of between uh, you know, Los Angeles and, and Arizona, that the first really big large scale solar projects uh, were being built in the United States. So like at the beginning of 2015, I was at the commissioning ceremony for this project called Desert Sunlight, which was the biggest solar farm in the country at the time it was 550 megawatts, which is huge and 3,800 acres and 
right outside of Joshua Tree National Park. And uh, President Obama's interior secretary at the time, Sally Jewell, was there to, to see this, you know, ribbon cutting ceremony. And it was it was exciting. Nothing like this had ever happened before. And in the eight, nine years since then, there have been dozens of big solar farms just like this. Um, most of them not quite so big, but that have been built all over the country. And you've got hundreds more that are proposed in the desert and all over the place, uh, all around the country. And so it, it took another dozen years after that cap and trade bill had failed in 2009, but uh, 2021 or last year, 2022, excuse me, climate finally passed a big climate bill, the Inflation Reduction Act. And that had some on the order of $370 billion for climate and clean energy projects. And I mean, that's not going to solve all of our problems, but but it's a big deal. We've, we've come a long way. Um, on the journalism front, I would also say that there is a lot more and a lot better journalism about the climate crisis than, uh, than there used to be. I mean, you know, just here in Los Angeles, uh, at the LA Times, I mean, I'm writing this, this twice weekly newsletter, Boiling Point, as, as Sunshine mentioned. And Part of what I do for that is I, I sort of do a roundup of what's being written about climate and the environment and energy all over the Western United States. And, and honestly, I have trouble keeping up with everything that's out there because there's just so much of it. And that's, that's even with all of the financial challenges that the journalism business faces and the revenue declines and, and the layoffs that we and others have unfortunately experienced and papers that are owned by hedge funds that, that just keep cutting things to the bone and, and decimating their staff, even with all of that, there is still so much strong climate reporting um, all over the country and, and in my focus in California and the West. I mean, just, just at the LA Times, we've got eight or 10 journalists doing this who are covering beats like water and air quality and public lands and wildfires and um, a, a whole lot more on that front. And there's, there's even more we could be doing. Um, I would say the TV news situation covering climate is, is not quite as good. There, there are still a few really, really good climate reporters on, on the networks and on cable. Um, just not as many as you see in, in print outlets. And there's a, a really huge growth of independent climate newsletters as well, uh, particularly on Substack, people who are just out there on their own doing it. Um, you got to be a little more careful with who you're listening to there when, when you have folks who aren't backed by a you know, sort of reputable news publication, but, but definitely a lot of good stuff being, being written that I would encourage you to seek out. Um, so lots of progress. But despite all of that, uh, not surprisingly, uh, I think there's a lot the journalism industry could be doing better on climate. And I'm going to share a, a few ideas here with some examples from my own work. Um, and if you're not a journalist uh, listening to this, and I, I expect that's the case for many of you, I hope you'll subscribe to your local news organization and really encourage them to do this kind of work, because that's, that's the kind of engagement that's going to help reading and subscribing and really showing that you're an active participant and, and urging people to do more and better. Um, so I think the, the first and most important lesson that I've got is journalists need to, to get comfortable saying straight up that climate change is a crisis and that we badly need to do something about it. And, and then actually hold politicians and government agencies and private companies accountable when they don't do that. Um, you mostly don't see reporters quoting climate deniers anymore, which is really good. Uh, that's pretty much gone by the wayside. But um, there are still way too many stories, and I, I see this a lot from political reporters, but not just political reporters, where where journalists present the issue as, well, there's a debate over climate change. Um, it's definitely happening, but one side says we need renewable energy, and the other side says it's too expensive and too unreliable, and there's just no good alternative to fossil fuels. And, and then that's the end of it, and the journalist sort of you know fails then to make clear that there, there absolutely is an urgent need for renewable energy. And and if the fossil fuel companies or the politicians or whoever say that renewable energy is not good enough on its own, then what's their alternative? What's their solution to climate? Um, that's the kind of story that, that really needs to be written in those situations. Um, so, you know, let's definitely drill in as journalists and figure out what are the, the challenges that we need to solve so we can power our society um, mostly or entirely without fossil fuels by but we, we need to start from a position of making it clear that we, we need desperately to figure out how to do that. And that's not a very comfortable idea for a lot of journalists. We were taught, you know, don't take sides in political debates, be neutral, just stick to the facts. Um, but where we are now, the fact is that we have a climate emergency and our main job as journalists is not to avoid people being mad at us or calling us biased. It's to make the world a better place and to help avoid as much death and suffering and inequality as we, we possibly can. It, it sounds dark, but it's just, it's where we're at. Um, I actually wrote a piece uh, last year, it was the beginning of last year, um, sort of making this argument that ran in the LA Times and Columbia Journalism Review and uh, covering climate now, it's a really good organization that helps uh, journalists with their climate coverage. 
Um, and if you'll forgive my quoting myself for a moment here, which I'll warn you, I'm going to do a few times. Um, I wrote in that piece, and I quote, in the same way that journalists ought to be comfortable denouncing systemic racism and pushing politicians to tackle homelessness, we need to get comfortable decrying the horrors of the climate crisis and demanding solutions, close quote. I, uh, I also wrote in that piece, and quote again, none of us is going to look back in 20 years and wonder if our climate stories were a little too radical. If we're lucky, we'll be living in a world where out of control fires, floods, and heat storms haven't completely upended human life and where journalism is still an economically viable pillar of democratic society. And I, I, I very much believe that. This isn't a time for journalists to be cautious with our climate coverage. It's a time to be bold. Um, so just to give you an example of, of one of the ways I've tried to do that, um, this was about two, two and a half years ago, right, as President Biden was taken off, taking office. I, I wrote a piece with the headline, oil and gas companies say they support climate action. Are they serious? And what I did for that piece was I listened in to these media calls that the, um, the US Chamber of Commerce and the American Petroleum Institute were hosting at the time where they were talking about why they opposed this moratorium that President Biden had just put on, on new oil and gas leases on federal lands. He was gonna stop doing these leases, at least temporarily. And of course, I asked some questions on those calls and you know, I, I analyzed everything. And in the piece that I was, I went through the industry's arguments one by one and explained what they were missing and what was the context they had left out. And, and to be clear, I didn't say that they were flat out wrong about everything because the truth was they weren't. They, they talked about potential for economic harm to fossil fuel communities, which is real. And they talked about how the U.S. couldn't exactly stop the rest of the world from producing oil and gas, which is definitely true. Um, but here's the conclusion I reached. And again, I'll, I'll quote, I wrote, the fossil fuel industry appears unwilling to support policies that phase down or eliminate oil and gas production. They say they want to work with Biden, but their idea of climate action differs enormously from what the president campaigned on and what scientists and activists say is necessary. The climate future envisioned by these companies allows large amounts of fossil fuels to continue to be burned. And if that future is incompatible with cutting emissions roughly in half by 2030 and zeroing them out by 2050, which scientists say is needed to avoid the worst consequences of climate change, I don't expect the industry to quietly accept its own demise, close quote. Um, and you know, I, I stand by having written that and what I really wanna emphasize is it's not advocacy to make statements like that as a journalist. It's, it's just stating the reality. It's what we are supposed to be doing as reporters helping people navigate the world and hopefully helping to solve these problems. And I think that brings me to the second lesson I've got for journalists, which is that it's, it's not, which follows on the first one, which is that it's not good enough to just say that climate change is a crisis and that we need solutions. It is really our job as reporters to scrutinize the different clean energy options on the table in front of us and to, to really try to be smart about which of those options we're taking seriously and writing about and, and how we're writing about them. It's not, not everything is created equal, right? There's a reason you're not gonna see me doing stories, excuse me, there's a reason you will see me doing stories all the time about solar and, and wind and batteries and um, less so about stuff like carbon capture and advanced nuclear and you know tidal wave energy and I mean, don't get me wrong, solar and wind and batteries aren't going to solve all of our problems. We're not going to be able to stop burning fossil fuels just on the back of, of those technologies and also power all of our electric cars and heat pumps and electric stoves. It's, it's going to take a lot more and we're going to need to figure out what that stuff is. Um, but the reality is solar and wind and batteries are the most successful clean energy technologies right now. The research shows that they can get us a lot of the way, if not most of the way to 100% clean energy. They're well-tested, they're cost-effective. That's why I spend most of my time on that stuff rather than spending a lot of time writing about things that, you know, while potentially very important and helpful or at this point, you know, more speculative with, with uncertain futures. So anyway, moral of that story, I spend most of my time focusing on what are the real barriers to 100% clean energy and how do we overcome them? Um, and, and that's taken me to some, some really interesting places. So let me start. Sunshine mentioned this at the top that I've been writing a lot about the tension between conservation and renewable energy, and um, that that's been really top of mind for me recently. Uh, so let me talk about that a little bit. Uh, my my main focus over the last year has been this series of stories called "Repowering the West," where basically what I've been doing is I've been traveling all over the Western United States and looking at 
how local communities in, in rural places in particular are responding to proposals to build big solar and wind farms. Um, you've got these really sunny, windy landscapes um, that in a lot of ways are perfect places for renewable energy. But almost everywhere you go and try to build this stuff, you'll find that there's some kind of opposition. Sometimes it's people who live in these rural towns and they don't want to look at the solar panels or the wind turbines or, you know, at a higher level, they're worried it's going to really interrupt and industrialize the peace and quiet that they love about where they live. Um, sometimes it's farmers and ranchers who don't want to see agricultural land taken out of production because these projects are often proposed for farmland. Um, sometimes it's Native American tribes. They, they see these big energy installations is desecrating their sacred landscapes. And a lot of the time it's conservationists. You actually have environmentalists, not all of them, but some of them who say that the destruction of, of wildlife habitat for big solar and wind farms is, is always or sometimes not worth it. Um, and you see a lot of these same issues, not just with solar and wind, but with lithium and, and other mining to support you know, batteries for electric cars and, and other stuff related to clean energy. Um, so I guess I'd say a few things. Some of these concerns are, are more legitimate than others, but the reality is, if we're going to do this extremely unprecedented build out of this massive amount of renewable energy in the United States to get off of fossil fuels, um, how we respond to that pushback against renewable energy is really going to determine whether this transition to clean energy happens or not. That the political reality, rural communities have a lot of power. Um, look at the composition of the US Senate. Um, indigenous tribes, they have treaty rights and the moral high ground because of the, the terrible history there of, of uh, oppression and colonization. And conservation groups, they have the courts. They can, you know, do lawsuits to block projects if, if that's what they want. Um, so I think the, the takeaway for journalists here is if you're writing about clean energy and climate, you really need to go the extra mile to hear out people on the ground when they've got these criticisms of solar and wind and really work hard to figure out what are the real issues that need to be dealt with and write stories that help you know, elected officials, members of the public that, that help us as a society figure out how to deal with this opposition and, and work through it and actually make sure we can build all the stuff we can need to build as fast as we need to build it without doing, you know, without doing any more harm than, than absolutely needs to be done. Um, I, no, so I'll give you an example. I had a I had a big story out just this week dealing with this theme. It was part three of that Repowering the West series that I mentioned. And basically what I did is earlier this year, I spent a week in, in Southern Nevada where you've got the biggest concentration of solar projects being built anywhere in the country. It's like dozens and dozens of projects that are proposed on public lands uh, surrounding Las Vegas out, out in the Mojave Desert. Um, and so I took a tour of, of one, one project in particular, one solar project that's under construction where the developers taking all of these sort of innovative and advanced steps to, to leave as much native vegetation in place as they can and to reintroduce desert tortoises to the project after it's built. And, and those are, you know, tortoises are protected under the Endangered Species Act. Um, and basically this developer is trying to set an example for others of here's a, you know, a more environmentally friendly way to do that. And then after that, I went and hung out in the desert for a while with some conservation activists who live out there and said, look, none of this is good enough. It's not going to work. The tortoises are still going to die, die off. And um, really, we should just be putting all of our solar on, on rooftops and parking lots and other spaces within cities. And I, I promise I'll get back to the rooftop solar question in, in just a couple minutes. But I would say one of the most um, sort of illuminating parts of this Nevada trip was there was this afternoon where I went off-roading in these like four, you know, four-wheel, real rough and tumble off-road vehicles with uh, which I had never done before. So that was quite an experience. And I went out with this guy who lives in Pahrump, this rural desert town about an hour north of, of Vegas. And I mean, dirt dirt bikes are basically his life. He teaches off-roading classes, he writes for off-road magazines, and, and this is his existence. And he is really, really frustrated that the public lands outside of Pahrump that he loves to ride on, and a, a big chunk of them are federal lands where developers are now trying to build solar farms. And, you know, this guy, he's still got plenty of places he can ride, but he's losing some of his favorite trails and um, sort of losing the freedom that he always felt on this you know, totally wide open landscape. It's, you know, it's like his playground and now parts of it are interrupted by by solar construction and by fences and he can't get where he wants to go. And you know, if you're listening to this and you're thinking, well, tough luck, we got to solve climate change. If a guy has less room to ride his off-road vehicle and that's the sacrifice, like tough for him. And I, I get that. Um, and I feel that to an extent, but uh, th this guy, Jimmy Lewis, he kept asking me while we were out there, how is it fair that, that Vegas or LA or whichever city is reaching its tentacles out here to change my world? Um, 
how is it fair that they're doing that to me before they've covered all of their own houses and parking lots with solar panels? Um, you know, why why shouldn't they have to do that first? Why can they come out here and, and mess up my world like this and not have to do it in their own backyards to the same extent? Um, and there's an answer to that sort of, which is that rooftop solar is, is more expensive than large solar farms in the desert and not everyone can afford to put solar panels on their roofs. And ultimately we're gonna need a lot of both of those technologies, um, big solar in the desert and, and also rooftops. But you know, again, even even with that, I, I I got where this guy was coming from. It's it's hard to tell somebody, hey, you've got to make this sacrifice for the greater good. Um, and you know, one one especially um, interesting moment we had out there. So we were riding riding the vehicles along the fence line of this solar farm called Yellow Pine that's already under construction, and and just sort of by happenstance, we ran into this um, environmental activist, a poet, and an activist who'd been out there camping by the site for, for months and months, uh, I think the year before or two years before that, and she was out back there today. And um, she'd been protesting the habitat destruction, the wildlife habitat that was getting lost to the solar project. And, you know, she and she and the off-road guy started chatting and it, you know, it, it didn't matter that uh, conservationists generally don't, don't like off-road vehicle, you know, people because of all the damage that driving through the desert can do to the ecology. The, they started chatting and these were two people who, you know, neither of them wanted to see these solar farms getting built. And uh, between the two of them and, and all sorts of other people, you know, in, in rural communities who feel the same way, um, they, they might be able to do something to stop all this renewable energy. They could they could end up being quite powerful. I, to quote, quote again, here's what I wrote in the piece. It's easy to imagine similar alliances forming across the West, the clean energy transition, bringing together environmentalists and rural residents in a battle to defend their lifestyles, their landscapes, and animals that can't fight for themselves. And I, I guess I would say this is really a tough balancing act. And, and again, you might be you might be thinking, look, we got to solve climate change. These folks just got to deal with it. Um, and I, you know, I acknowledge that in, in the piece that I wrote, but the reality is that at least some of the concerns that are being raised here are legitimate concerns. And the people raising those concerns are getting louder and they're talking to their elected officials and you know, if, we're, if we ignore this, we do it at our own peril. It is, it is just really, really important for journalists to take these stories seriously. And if you care about renewable energy, if you care about climate, um, tell stories about the people who are, who are trying to stop this stuff from getting built. Don't, don't just repeat everything they say verbatim because some of it's misinformation that they've heard and some of it's not based in reality, but, but some of it is, um, and some of it's gonna matter. And just to, to go back to rooftop solar for a minute, as I, as I said I would earlier, um, I, I want to emphasize there really is a huge opportunity for, for rooftops. So I hear from people about this all the time. Why don't we just put it all on our rooftops? Why don't we put it all within cities? Um, why don't we do this in ways that don't involve paving over wildlife habitat, um, putting solar and wind farms on former mines as well, on fallowed farmland? And I, I go into more detail in the Nevada piece on, you know, on that question and, and why, you know, why that's not going to be enough, unfortunately. But but it's true. The more the more solar we put on rooftops, the less we're going to need of these, you know, really big solar and wind farms that that can be controversial environmentally and for other reasons. And this sort of gets into the third key lesson that I, I've learned and want to share covering energy and climate, which is that people bring a lot of biases that have nothing to do with energy and climate to these conversations and to these debates. Um, you know, just for example, when I whenever I write about solar farms, I, I hear from people who see see these big renewable energy projects as just another way for the big companies and the utilities to profit at our expense. And you know, they think the only good climate solution is to take back power from those big energy companies and the big utilities and put solar on every rooftop and and sort of rebuild our energy systems and and make energy much more democratic. Um, and there's totally value in thinking about that. And and there's some opportunity to do it too. Um, but if you're thinking about this from a climate perspective and you're looking for the, the quickest and most feasible way to deal with climate change, um, that is typically not going to be it. Uh, you know, big, big companies maintaining their power and making a lot of money, uh, for, for better or worse, that is going to be part of, if, if not a very big part of how we solve climate change. Um, and the flip side of that is you, you get big utility companies and energy companies arguing that you know, the only way to solve climate change is, is let them maintain their monopolies and forget about rooftop solar. And, and that's not quite the case either. So I just think it's important for journalists who are telling these stories um, to try really hard to isolate the climate challenge and the energy realities and sort of help people who, who want to solve climate and who want to see clean energy replace fossil fuels sort of sort through some of the, 
the vested interests and the political philosophies that are you know coming into play and sort of you know sort of taking these conversations in maybe a different direction. Um, so at the same time, and you know, fourth fourth major lesson here, uh, sometimes isolating climate is also not the right idea. Um, we need to understand climate change in the larger context of the fossil fuel economy and all of the injustices that that fossil fuel economy is tangled up in. I'm, I'm talking about air pollution and water pollution from fossil fuel infrastructure, especially in Black and Latino communities and, and low-income communities. And I'm talking about the racist legacy of redlining and freeways slicing through uh, through communities of color. And I'm talking about all the coal plants and the coal mines on indigenous lands that are still have a real polluting legacy. And I'm talking about indoor air pollution from gas stoves, which is a topic of a, a growing body of research and public interest. Um, a lot of the time I see climate change stories that are talking about you know, greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuels and climate impacts, but don't even allude to all of those other harms from fossil fuels. And uh, on the flip side, I'll see pieces about all of those other harms that don't say anything about climate change. And I, I think that's unfortunate because these are all pieces of the same story, which is a story about how and why we transition our economy away from coal and oil and fossil natural gas. Um, obviously not every news story can get into every issue that's just not practical, it's not possible. Um, but I, I've tried to do it as, as best I can. I, you know, one example I'll give you is that um, a couple of years ago in Southern California, we had this huge oil spill off the coast. And a lot of my my colleagues at the LA Times were out there doing, you know, really amazing and, and valuable work covering the impacts of the spill on the ground. And while they were doing that, I wrote a piece with the headline and I quote, fossil fuels are astonishingly harmful. The Orange County oil spill is just a reminder. Um, and if you'll indulge me again for a minute here, I just want to read you the first couple of paragraphs of that story, which I, I think are a, a pretty good example of the kind of, you know, bringing everything together that I'm trying to talk about. So here, here's how the story began. When scientists and activists make the case for phasing out fossil fuels, they often focus on the climate crisis. Stop burning coal and oil and natural gas, and we can prevent wildfires, droughts, heat waves, and storms from continuing to get worse. But the catastrophic oil spill in Southern California over the weekend offered a stark reminder that the damage to human health and the natural world from powering society with fossil fuels is far greater than just a warming planet. Experts pointed to the leaking oil pipeline off the Orange County coast as just one example of the nonstop harm caused by drilling, production, and combustion. Even without the climate crisis, there are many reasons to refashion the global economy around solar and wind energy, they said. Those reasons include astonishingly deadly air pollution, contamination of water supplies, destruction of wildlife habitat, and the never-ending barrage of leaks, spills, and blowouts that can kill people and animals and stain beloved landscapes. Obviously, I go on in the story after that to substantiate all of that and provide links to studies and details and you know further further information. But hopefully, that you know those top two paragraphs spell it out pretty clearly. Um, I tried to do the same thing just a couple of months ago, uh, writing about a study that had just come out of the University of Southern California, and and this study was really interesting. It found that people in Los Angeles who drive more tend to be less exposed to air pollution, but people who drive less tend to be exposed to more air pollution. Um, and, and basically this was, you know, it sounds contradictory, but this was all tied up in the history of freeways being built through communities of color. So you have, uh, you know, a lot of wealthier white, you know, typically whiter people who can afford more gasoline and to drive more, you know, driving on these freeways through communities of color. Um, and the way I summarized it in the story was this, and I quote, it may sound like a paradox, but it's not. It's a function of the racism that shaped this city and its suburbs and continues to influence our daily lives. And it's a stark reminder of the need for climate solutions that benefit everyone. So again, what I was trying to do there, bring together the climate reality with the other injustices at play. And I you know, I'm, I'm proud of having written it that way. And I will say it did not win me many fans among the sort of anti-woke crowd. Um, I think the headline of the piece in, in particular sort of pissed people off. And I'll, I'll admit it was pretty provocative, but I think it was accurate. The headline was, quote, how white and affluent drivers are polluting the air breathed by LA's people of color. Um, and the result of that headline was basically the story going viral in the, the right-wing media, which happens from time to time when you write about this stuff. Um, Fox News literally aired five segments about it, which was kind of nuts. Um, 
Tucker Carlson and, and Laura Ingram both brought it up and, and attacked me pretty personally and by name. Um, Donald Trump Jr. tweeted about the story. Elon Musk tweeted about it. Um, and you know, it was it was nasty. I don't mean to make light of it. I got I got thousands of, of sort of hate mail type messages, uh, many of which were were anti-Semitic, um, which was really un unpleasant. But you know, well, I well, I certainly would have preferred not having to deal with all of that reaction. It did make me feel like, okay, I've I've written something worthwhile here. And it I think it goes back to the point I made earlier that avoiding criticism is not our, you know, should not be our main goal as journalists. We you know, what we really need to do is just make these realities about climate and clean energy and fossil fuels and pollution as clear as we possibly can. And, you know, the, the clear reality is that there are huge racial disparities done in the, you know, harm from climate pollution and regular old air pollution, and we should make that clear and tie those things together. Um, and that brings me to my, my fifth and uh, penultimate lesson here uh, for journalists, which is that um, we really need to think about holding everyone accountable, uh, not not just the fossil fuel companies and you know the the conservative politicians who don't want to do anything about climate. I'm talking about the states and the cities and the companies that are are actually working hard or at least trying to work hard to solve this problem. I mean, I, I live in California, which has a national reputation and and really a global reputation as a climate leader. This was. You know, this was one of the first states to pass a law requiring 100% clean energy. The, the governor, Gavin Newsom, recently got a regulation approved that is going to require ending the sale of, of most gasoline vehicles by 2035, which is pretty remarkable. And, and there's a lot more. That's just the tip of the iceberg. But again, the reality is that as much good as California is doing on climate, um, there are just so many areas where the state is falling short. And I've, I've written a lot of stories about that and stories, you know, quoting people who are criticizing Governor Newsom and criticizing his appointees for not doing more or not doing better. I mean, for instance, on the 100% clean energy thing, I've written a lot of stories about why aren't we moving faster? We've got this law requiring 100% clean energy by 2045. But meanwhile, you've got a lot of activists and scientists who say we should be aiming for 100% by 2035. And in fact, President Biden has endorsed that goal. He campaigned on it. So, you know, what what gives? Why is California still 10 years behind that? What's the answer to that question? Um, and another big question I've, I've been asking is, are we, even with the 25, 2045 date, are we on track to get to 100% by then? Um, just a couple years ago over the summer in California on these really hot evenings, we had rolling blackouts. Uh, everyone was blasting their air conditioners and then the sun went down and all the solar panels stopped generating and suddenly we didn't have enough energy to go around to everyone. So how how is it that we let ourselves get in that situation where renewable energy couldn't get the job done? I mean, should we should we not have seen that coming? Um, how, how you know, looking forward, how many batteries and other types of energy storage projects are we going to need to store sunlight for the evening and make sure this doesn't happen again. And, and why haven't we already built those projects? Why are we behind? Um, and what are the other technologies that we're going to need, by the way, looking forward to, to get off of fossil fuels? Because right now, gas-fired power plants still provide like a third of California's power. And also, and I've been writing about this, right now, rather than uh, shutting down gas plants, the state has been allowing certain ones that were supposed to close stay open longer because they're worried that we'll not have enough power without them. So how do we stop doing that? Is it is it geothermal energy or offshore wind turbines or green hydrogen? Um, this is, you know, the situation where I do get into those questions about, you know, what are those other pieces that we need to to get the rest of the way there on top of the the solar and the wind? Um, and, you know, California, the reason this matters big picture is it's not just, you know, California, you've got other super progressive states, New York, Massachusetts, a couple others that are trying really hard to set an example for the rest of the country and the world and, and really show people like, hey, yes, it is possible to stop burning fossil fuels and still have a thriving economy and still have reliable power. And the result of that is if California and these other states get it wrong, and if we continue to have power shortages or there are big job losses or electricity just gets crazy expensive, the result of that is going to be that the rest of the world is not going to want to follow our lead and, and with good reason. So it's it's really just so important for journalists to you know hold these climate leaders accountable and make sure that they they get it right. Um, you know, I've been doing similar stories. I'll just mention briefly about the city of Los Angeles, which which is in fact planning for 100 percent clean energy by 2035, which you know, as I said, is sort of at the, the cutting edge of where folks um you know think we should be. Um, as part of that plan, though, the, the city has got this you know, somewhat controversial plan of, you know, rather than shut down its gas plants and stop burning gas, it's going to start burning hydrogen at these facilities instead. And 
some climate activists think that's a great idea and some scientists think it's a great idea and um, you know, others think it's a scam and it's it's never going to work. And there's a you know an, an important debate here that I've uh, tried to really get into and help people figure out what's the right answer. And I'll admit that this is a case where I'm not sure what the right answer is. And there's sort of compelling arguments on both sides. So you know, it's not that all climate stories just need to be you know oh you know one side is right, one side is wrong. You know, uh, there are really legitimate questions and cases here where. It's difficult to parse, and it's our job as journalists to hear people out on both sides of those arguments and sort of help guide the public, but not necessarily tell them what the right answer is, because we don't know what the right answer is. And that's that's sort of been my experience covering this, this green hydrogen question in Los Angeles. Um, so one one more lesson here that I'll, I'll share, um, which is that as much as I hope that all of the environmental journalists listening to this will take my advice and, you know, I'll never have to worry about it again. Um, the reality is that the story of climate change cannot just be the responsibility of climate and environmental journalists. And part of the problem is there aren't enough of us, but part of it is that climate change is truly an everything story. On just about every beat in every newsroom, there are climate angles that just really badly need to be explored if you want to do your audience the service of giving them a full and complete picture of the world they're navigating. I mean, let me, weather, for instance, weather might sound like an obvious one, but I still see so many stories about heat waves and extreme storms and wildfires that don't mention climate change, which I think is just a huge disservice to readers. And I mean, it goes beyond that. Sports reporters, for instance, a couple of weeks ago, you might have seen we had for the first time Major League Baseball games canceled or postponed, at least due to wildfire smoke from the smoke from those fires up in Canada. Um, so, you know, sports reporters, heat, heat as well as a big issue. Sports reporters need to be thinking about this. If you write about entertainment, the entertainment industry. What are the studios and the media companies doing to reduce their emissions? What are they doing to show the realities of climate change in the movies and TV shows they're producing? If you write about food, how is climate change affecting which crops can be grown and where they can be grown? If you write about fashion, what's up with sustainable fashion? I mean, there, these questions are everywhere. Politics is another obvious one and same with foreign affairs. And I mean, immigration, everyone who's thinking about immigration needs to be thinking about the refugee flows that unfortunately are already underway because of extreme weather uh, being made worse by climate change, which there's all sorts of research about. So moral of the story, this is a team effort. This is something that every journalist everywhere needs to be thinking about and that editors and publishers need to be thinking about. How do they train their staff so that, that folks feel comfortable covering this stuff, even if it's not their expertise? And again, to go back to what I said earlier, if you're, you know, if you read newspapers or if you read the news online or if you watch the news on TV, um, you need to be proactively asking for this kind of coverage. And like I said, like I said, subscribe, support your local newspaper. They're not going to be around long enough to, to get this stuff right, but you absolutely have a, a role to play in making this happen. So, okay, those are my lessons. Um, I really appreciate everyone being here for this discussion, and I, I hope we get some good questions now in the Q&A. Uh, and if you don't mind my just doing a real quick plug here, the newsletter that uh, that Sunshine mentioned earlier and that I mentioned, it's called Boiling Point. It comes out twice a week. And if you uh, if you want to sign up for it, you don't have to be an LA Times subscriber. I hope you think about that too. But you can sign up for the newsletter by going to latimes.com slash boiling point, latimes.com slash boiling point, and just enter your email address there and you'll hear from me twice a week. So uh, thank you for listening and let's uh, let's do some questions. Thank you so much, Sammy. That was absolutely terrific. Um, we really appreciate your insights. Hard-earned insights, I might add. Um, Thank you. So to get to get this conversation going, and again, I urge everyone um, to submit your questions either via the chat or even better via the Q and A function. Um, I so obviously you're reporting for a. a large or at least relatively speaking large news outlet that has um better resources even in the context of the reduced resources that newsrooms have these days right so um how would you recommend that um reporters who are working in smaller more resource constrained um, newsrooms apply some of these um, various tips that you provided? Like, do you think that they just translate across the board or do you think that there are some, and I'm asking this by the way, um, for the sake of our audience, not all of whom are journalists, right? And so I think it would be um, interesting for everyone to get a better understanding of like, what might it look like to translate these particular 
um, approaches toward covering climate change in a smaller, more local newsroom? Sure, that, that's a great question. Um, I think the first thing I would say is these are these are stories that are really applicable in every local community. And if you're a local news reporter, you know whether it's a city or a small town or a county, to first off really look at what are the climate impacts happening in your community. Um, extreme heat is an issue pretty much everywhere. Extreme heat is the deadliest result of climate change. The research shows it's a little surprising, but you know if you look at actual mortality from different extreme weather events, um, heat kind of outshines it all. So. You know, really look at you know, are there people who are suffering from heat in your community, elderly populations, outdoor workers, people who don't have air conditioning? Does your community have you know shade centers and places where people can go to cool off? What is you know, and, and across heat and other climate impacts as well, you know, what is your local government, your city council, your county supervisors, what are they doing to help people protect themselves? Are they are they providing resources so people can stay cool when it's hot? Are they providing places where people can breathe clean air? Um you know, when, when the air is smoky from wildfires, what are they doing during storms with local infrastructure? Because storms are getting worse. Um, what are they doing with, with building regulations and appliances? Are they doing things to help people or require people to, you know, move from gas stoves and gas heating, which can be polluting and contribute to climate change to, you know, cleaner electric or induction stoves? Um, these are these are really important and vital local news and local government stories. And Certainly, if you're covering state government and you have a you know a state house in your community, you know look at what the legislature is and isn't doing. Um, and I would just also say that even if you don't have you know a climate scientist in your community or, or someone who's really an expert on this, there are so many folks out there at, at major universities and think tanks and, and research groups who are just so so eager to you know help help and walk you through the science and and sort of give you a you know a bigger broader perspective on the forces that are affecting your communities. So don't. Definitely don't hesitate to to figure out who that is in your state or in your part of the country and reach out to them and, and I'm sure they'll be happy to help you. Thanks. Um, this is I'm showing my bias right now as um, you know the, a person that does science training for journalists. But I'm wondering, what do you think um, are some of the skills that facilitate your coverage of climate change stories like what are the things the either like the knowledge or the particular reporting skills that you think are really useful for you as you dive into these stories oh that's a good question um well i mean just sure having a having a base understanding or being able to ask you know science and math related questions is helpful like not if you know if you're no good at that like that's fine you can still do good stories that are less science or math based but that, that helps um but I think in general, the main thing I would say is just being very well read about this stuff um, is really helpful. Like I, I mentioned earlier, how much is getting written, how, you know, trying to write this this newsletter and cover everything that's happening, it's overwhelming. But one of the good things about that is just there, there's so much good and informative stuff being written. If if you, you know, set yourself some some Google alerts and sign up for some, you know, there are a lot of good newsletters out there that just compile headlines that keeping up with what's happening in in your part of the country and and nationally and even globally it's um it really helps you quickly develop the expertise that you need to ask good questions and then to sort of apply the lessons to your own community and figure out what needs to happen there or what stories need to be told there great thank you um another question that uh relates to um what you said about um really digging into the conflicts uh, that are out there, these very real conflicts. Um, so when, in, you know, and thinking about specifically this um, this person that you talked about in Nevada, I think. Yeah, um, the off-road guy. Yeah, the off-road guy. Yeah. So when, when you um, write these stories that are really presenting the conflicts in, in a, just a very upfront way, what sort of response do you get to those stories? Just from a kind of across the spectrum of people who are reading them. Uh, that's such a good question. Um, well, anytime I write about there being a need for large scale solar and wind farms, I get tons of responses from people who are really unhappy with that narrative and who say, we just got to put it on the, you know, why are we destroying the environment? Just put it all on roofs and we'll be fine, as I alluded to. Um, I have actually a follow-up to the Nevada piece that's out today that, that's trying to get exactly at that question of why, you know, rooftop solar is valuable, but not enough. And I'm getting a lot of the same responses. 
Um, I get a lot of nuclear responses. Um, pretty much anything I write about climate change and dealing with climate change that isn't explicitly about nuclear energy, I'm kind of inundated with uh, nuclear bro type responses. Not that they're all bros. I, you know, it's a sort of a slang terminology, but but people who are pro-nuclear, who, who have many legitimate and worthwhile arguments, but who are in many cases very upset at anything that's not about nuclear energy and think that's the only solution. And why am I not talking about nuclear energy? Which I which I do, and I've talked about in plenty of stories, so they should just go read those stories. Um, and, you know, I, I think I get a lot of, you know, just from sort of the broader public, people who are either, you know, read the piece and they think, oh, this is so depressing, we're never, you know, you're putting out, pointing out all these problems, why are we, you know, how are we ever going to solve this, we're doomed, how do you avoid feeling doomed? And then on the flip side, I, I get people who read them and say, you know, thank you for for writing about solutions. We get that it's hard, but like at least there are possible solutions out there. This this gave me hope and made me feel less gloomy. So it, uh, you know, it, it, I definitely find myself navigating back and forth between those two extremes. But I, I find as a whole that writing about renewable energy and writing about climate solutions, even if I'm focused a lot on the challenges and what we need to still figure out, it's it, it feels really good to be part of the conversation and part of trying to figure out how we get there, which sort of helps me keep going and avoid delving into too much gloom and doom. And I, th I think that's the same for a lot of people who work on this stuff and a lot of people who read my, my stories as well. That makes me wonder about um, the work that some news organizations are doing. I don't know if the LA Times is doing this or how, um, in that is focused on community engagement um, and really, building out conversations about the various issues that are facing a community, but via the the news outlet itself. Is that something that the LA Times does at all? Or is that something that, that you have participated in, in like in a broader way than just via your yeah. internet? Well, we definitely we do events from time to time and bring people in. Um, I'd like to do more of it. I haven't done one recently. One thing that I have done is in in Boiling Point, my newsletter, a couple of times, I've done sort of audience surveys and audience polls where I've asked people on some of these exact topics, you know, what do you, do you think that what did you think of California's decision to reduce incentives for rooftop solar power? Or would you be OK with, you know, a wind turbine off the coast if you live on the coast or a solar farm outside your community, if you live somewhere rural? And, you know, how do you feel about that? And then and then I you know read through those responses, which have numbered in the thousands at times and, you know, picked some out and then written follow up pieces like, hey, here's here's what people shared with me. Here are some main themes. You know, here's some select quotations and, you know, try to try to engage the community that way. Actually, right after this, for for those who may want to go and ask me even more questions at 1130 Pacific, um, 230 31, yeah, two thirty Eastern. I'm doing an AMA and ask me any, anything on Reddit, on the uh, the environment subreddit. We, we've done those for previous editions of Repowering the West, and people have been really into that. So I, I'm sure I'll have lots of uh, lots of questions and comments to go tackle in uh, just a few minutes here. Oh well, that's a terrific, a bunch of terrific examples of community engagement. Um, so Phoebe had a question that was kind of similar to the one that I asked a few minutes ago, except specifically focusing on the woke, anti-woke polarity you talked about. You know, mm -hmm. you know, how do you how do you navigate your reporting in a world? This is the question. How do you navigate reporting in a world where readers expect information to fall into one camp or another? So this is just like another angle on that previous question. Yeah. I hate to say that there's just not a lot I can do about it. Um you know, I mean, there, there are ways that I try, right? I, I mean, one thing that I've, I, more journalists are starting to do and that I've really tried to do both in Repowering the West and in Boiling Point is to be just really transparent about where I'm coming from and what my own biases are. Um, you know, I, I, I've been writing a lot in first person, um, especially the piece I have today on rooftop solar, really like just sort of trying to be transparent. Like, here's, here's what I, you know, I, I I'm not telling you what you should think. Here are both sides. Here are the arguments. But you know, here's sort of where I approach this from, and why I'm writing about it in this way, and sort of what are some of the conclusions that I personally draw from this. Acknowledging that you know this is this is not the only way to think about it, and that there are legitimate reasons that others feel differently. Um, I've, I've tried to do more of that, and and does that you know does that solve it for everybody? No, like I still get plenty of responses from people on the left and right and all over the place who just assume I'm a shill for this or that or whatever and that um you know I just I'm, I'm terrible for not seeing it exactly the way they see it and clearly I'm captured by somebody or something else but but that but but writing in that way has helped I think 
Um, and just, you know, again, trying to hear out all the sides, even if there's a side that I, I don't think gets it exactly right. Like I try to avoid putting a, a misinformation in my stories. Like I want to keep things factual and not just quote somebody who doesn't like a solar farm, you know, saying that really it's going to heat up the planet, which is not true, but you hear people say that kind of thing. But to the extent that there are legitimate arguments and concerns, even if I personally might think, well, you know, this, this is really missing the bigger picture, taking the time to go through it and explain where they're coming from and put it in context and just make people feel heard, where even if I ultimately land somewhere different at the end of the story, that people reading it will have really, you know, heard their side and that they'll, they'll feel like they had a chance to make their case to folks. That helps. Yeah, that's, thank you for explaining that. Um, uh, we have time for one last question, and this is an anonymously posed question, um, following up on what you're just saying. So this is, this person is a communications professional, and uh, they write that they pitch climate stories and connect journalists to sources, um, but they find that, you know, the, the, the so-called doom and gloom stories sent, tend to get picked up more often than the more positive stories. So they wonder, um, what the question is, what can I do to get a reporter to pick up more positive stories? Yeah. Um, that's a really good question. I, I wish I had an easy answer for that one. I, I think reporters, like a lot of humanity, are unfortunately uh, predisposed to you know, doom and gloom type stuff. Uh, keep trying, obviously. I guess the main thing that I would say to communications professionals in general that might help on this front is, uh, you know, pitch, just pitching stories out of left field typically does not work. Um, maybe it works for some types of journalists, for those who cover the environment and are really in this stuff day in, day out. It's not going to be a successful strategy. I I get hundreds of press releases every week in my inbox, maybe thousands just, and, and frankly, I don't even read them because I just don't have the capacity. I'm so you know busy doing my own stuff. The advice that I would give is, is really focus on building relationships with reporters, like you know, rather than just pitching them on stuff, you know, make yourself available as a resource. Um you know, help them connect with sources that might be relevant for them, even if that source, you know, doesn't have an opportunity to, you know, pitch their product or their study or their thing in that article. Um, the, the communications professionals that I am by far the most likely to hear out and respond to and work with are the ones who I know personally, who I know are actually trying to help me do my job and who have helped me do my job even at times when it doesn't benefit them or their clients. Those are the ones who, when I see something in my inbox, I'm actually gonna have to take the time to look at it and engage with it. So yeah, I would just say it's, you know, hopefully relationship building helps get you to a point where when you have those positive stories, they're more willing to hear you out. Uh, well, that's a terrific note to end on. Um, and uh, so let me, again, thank you, Sammy, for just a really fantastic conversation. Very much appreciate your insights. Thanks to all of you who joined us today. And as a final reminder, you can still make um, a gift if you're inspired by the, these talks. And certainly if you're inspired by everything Sammy Roth has to say about all of the ways that you can help journalists do this really important reporting, then don't miss your chance to make a gift to Metcalf Institute's um, Roadie Now Fund this year. Your gift will be matched dollar for dollar if you make it by tomorrow. Um, so thanks to everyone. Don't forget you can view all of this month's lectures on our um, on the Metcalf Institute YouTube channel, as well as um, hundreds of other um, programs we've done in the past. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks again. Take care. <laughs>